Hello YouTube, my name is Neil and we're studying for the MCATs today. We're in the Organic Chemistry Review, Chapter 2, Isomers. An important way that we distinguish between molecules is by identifying isomers of the same compound, those that have the same molecular formula but different structures. Keep in mind that isomerism describes a relationship just as there must be at least two children to have siblings. Two molecules can be isomers to each other, but no molecule can be an isomer by itself. Throughout this chapter, we will learn how to identify these relationships and describe the similarities and differences between isomers. Figure 2.1 shows the isomer classes that we will learn about more and how they are related. Feel free to come back to this figure as a reference after you have read through the more detailed explanations. Structural isomers. Oops. Structural isomers are the least similar of all isomers. In fact, the only thing that structural isomers also called constitutional isomers, share is their molecular formula, meaning that their molecular weights must be the same. Aside from this similarity, structural isomers are widely varied and different chemical and physical properties with different chemical and physical properties. For example, five different structural isomers of C6H14 are shown in figure 2.2. Each of these molecules look completely different but has the same number of carbon and hydrogen atoms. So between hexane, methyl pentane, dimethyl butane, they all have the same chemical formula, but they're quite different structurally. Physical and chemical properties are prime MCAT material and are often tested in the context of isomerism. Physical properties are characteristics of processes that don't change the composition of matter, such as melting point, boiling point, solubility, odor, color, and density. Chemical properties have to do with the reactivity of the molecule with other molecules and result in changes in chemical composition. In organic chemistry, the chemical properties of compounds are generally dictated by the functional groups in the molecules. All right, what property or properties do structural isomers have in common? Uh, the same chemical formula. Of the compounds, cycle, uh, they also have uh, molecular weights, similar, the same molecular weights. Of the compounds, cyclopropanol, 2-propanol, acet acetone, and prop 2 and all, which are structural isomers of each other. Cyclopropanol. Uh, what is it? Uh, methane, ethane, butane, propane. So four, yeah. That would be a cyclopropanol. Oh, cyclopropane, pro propanol. Two propanol. One, two, three, four. Oh, no. One, two, three, four. And on the two, ketone, I guess acetone, and prop two,
propene. So there's a diene. So a double bond between the first two carbons. So I switch those around. It's got the double bond on the second carbon and a alcohol on the first. So which are structural isomers? Only the first two. Cyclopropanol and 2-propanol are isomers. Acetone is different. Uh, pro propenol is different. Number three, what are physical properties? Give three examples of physical properties. Color, odor, uh, boiling point. There are properties that don't change with the quantity, I guess. Characteristics that don't change the composition of matter. Chemical properties uh, have to do with reactivity. And results in changes in chemical composition. All right. Structural isomers have the same chemical form eula. And molecular weight. And we have this great diagram of isomers. Structural, same connectivity, no. Structural, yes, stereoisomers. Require bond breaking to interconvert. No, then they're conformational. Yes, they're configurational. Non superimposable mirror images. No, diastereomers. Yes, enantiomers. So they don't change through the mirror. Differ in uh, arrangement around an immovable bond. Yes, cis trans. Great. <clears throat> Should we check the answers of these? No, pretty confident with those. Two point two stereo isomers. Like structural isomers, and all isomers for that matter, stereoisomers have the same chemical formula. Unlike structural isomers, however, stereoisomers also share the same atomic connectivity. In other words, they have the same structural backup, backbone. Stereoisomers differ in how these atoms are arranged in space, their wedge and dish pattern. And all isomers that are not structural isomers fall under this category. The largest distinction within this class is between conformational and configurational isomers. Conformational isomers differ in rotation around single sigma bonds. Configurational isomers can be interconverted only by breaking bonds. So 
So conformational isomers. Of all the isomers, conformational isomers or conformers are the most similar. Conformational isomers are in fact the same molecule only at different points in their natural rotation around single sigma bonds. Conformational isomers uh, differ only in uh, rotation around a single sigma bond. Rotation around sigma bond. While double bonds hold molecules in a specific position as explained with cis-trans isomers later, single bonds are free to rotate. Conformational isomers arise from the fact that varying degrees of rotation around single bonds can create different levels of strain. These conformations are easy to see when the molecule is depicted in a Newman projection, in which the molecule is visualized along a line extending through a carbon-carbon bond axis. This classic example for demonstrating conformational isomerism is a straight chain. In a straight chain is butane, which is shown in figure 2.3. New then projection and what you're gonna have is a circle with some bonds in the front and some bonds in the back uh, you have one CH3 in the back and one CH3 in the front and the rest is hydrogens And in this configuration, the CH3s are going off in different directions. They're opposite each other. This is the anti-staggered arrangement. Straight chain conformations. For butane, the most stable conformation occurs when the two methyl groups containing C1 and C4, carbon 1 and carbon 4, are oriented 180 degrees away from each other. In this position, there is minimal steric repulsion between the atom's electron clouds because they are as far apart as can possibly be. Thus, the atoms are happiest in their lowest energy state because there is no overlap of atoms along the straight line of sight besides C2 and C3. The molecule is said to be in a staggered conformation. Specifically, it is called the anti-conformation because the two largest groups are anti-paraplanar in the same plane, but on opposite sides to each other. This is the most energetically favorable type of staggered conformation. The other type of staggered conformation called gauche occurs when the two largest groups are 60 degrees apart. So while this is an anti-configuration, If they were sixty degrees apart, that'd be like a CH three and another CH three pretty close to it, and the rest are H's.
To convert from the anti to the gauche conformation, the molecule must pass through an eclipse conformation, which the two methyl groups are 120 de uh, de degrees apart, 120 degrees apart, and overlap with the hydrogen atoms on the adjacent carbon. When the two methyl groups directly overlap each other with zero degrees separation, the molecule is said to be totally eclipsed and is in its highest energy state. Totally eclipsed conformations are the least favorable energetically because the two largest groups are syn paraplanar or in the same plane and on the same side. The different staggered and eclipsed conformations are demonstrated in figure 2.3 and 2.4. For compounds larger than butane, the name of the conformation is decided by the relative position of the two largest substituents about a given carbon-carbon bond. So we have the anti, the gauche, then we have, let's do an eclipsed, where we have two coming out the top and two coming out in each direction. Let's go CH3, H, We have the eclipsed and the totally eclipsed conformations. All right. Figure 2.5 shows the plot of potential energy versus degree of rotation about the bond between this C2 and C3 in butane. It show the, shows the relative minima and maxima of potential energy of the molecule throughout its various conformations. Remember that every molecule wants to be in the lowest energy state possible. So the higher the energy, the less time the molecule will spend in that energetically favorable state. And we have the highest energy is the totally eclipsed. Lowest in energy is the anti-staggered. These conformational interconversion barriers are small, 19 kilocal per mole between anti-staggered butane and totally eclipsed butane, and are easily overcome at room temperature. Nevertheless, at very low temperatures, conformational interconversions are dramatically slow. If the molecules do not possess sufficient energy to cross the energy barrier, they may not rotate at all, as happens to all molecules at absolute zero. Cyclic conformations. Should I write down that they rotate less at lower temperatures? Rotate less at lower temp. 
cyclic conformations. Cyclic cycloalkanes can be either fairly stable compounds or fairly unstable depending on ring strain. Ring strain arises from three factors, angle strain, torsional strain, and non-bonded strain, sometimes referred to as steric strain. Let's write these down. Ring strain can be angle strain, torsional, and non-bonded or steric. Angle strain results when angle, bond angles deviate from their ideal values by being stretched or compressed. Torsional strain results, so that's angle strain. Torsional strain results when cyclic molecules must assume conformations that have eclipsed or gauche interactions. All right. Non-bonded strain, van der Waals repulsion, we got another name for steric strain, also van der Waals. Van der Waals repulsion. Results when non adjacent atoms or groups compete for the same space. Non bonded strain is the dominant source of steric strain in the flagpole interactions. of the cyclohexane boat conformation. So the flagpole interactions of the cyclohexane boat conformation. Boat cyclohexane. So non-bonded strain is a source of steric strain I'm going to put flagpole interactions here too. Interactions. To alleviate the strain, cycloalkanes attempt to adopt various non-planar conformations. Cyclobutane puckers into a slight V shape. Cyclopentane adopts what is called an envelope conformation. And cyclohexane, as you will undoubtedly see the most on the MCAT, exists mainly in three conformations called the chair boat and twist or skew boat forms. These cycloalkanes are shown in figure 2.6. So you got the chair, the boat, and the twist boat. So, let's write a couple of these. Let's draw, draw a couple of these. Chair. Kind of like that. That works. Boat.
twist boat or skew boat? I'm not really sure what is going on here, but there's some kind of cross. And it looks like a W. It looks like a Wonder Woman symbol or a Batman symbol, maybe. All right, the most stable conformation of cyclohexane is the chair conformation, which minimizes all three types of strain. The hydrogen atoms that are perpendicular to the plane of the ring sticking up or down are called axial, and those parallel sticking out are called equatorial. The axial equatorial orientations alternate about the ring. That is, if the wedge on C1 is an axial group, the dash on C2 will also be axial. The wedge on C3 will be axial and so on. Cyclohexane can undergo a chair flip in which one chair form is converted to the other. In this process, the cyclohexane molecule briefly passes through a fourth conformation called the half chair conformation. After the chair flip, all axial groups become equatorial and all equatorial groups become axial. All dashes remain dashes and all wedges remain wedges. This interconversion can be slowed if a bulky group is attached to the ring, tert butyl groups are classic examples of bulky groups on the MCAT. For substituted rings, the bulkiest group will favor the equatorial position to reduce non bonded strain or flagpole interactions. Non bonded strain. is synonymous with flagpole interactions in this case. To reduce non-bonded strain with axial groups in the molecule as shown in figure 2.7. Uh, so we got a half chair they don't show us a picture of the half chair But also, tert -butyl, butyl groups <clears throat> are bulky groups. They like to align themselves equatorially. Bulky groups like tert butyl. align themselves equatorially. All right. In rings with more than one substituent, the preferred chair form is determined by the larger group, which will prefer the equatorial position. These rings also have associated nomenclature. If both groups are located on the same side of the ring, the molecule is called cis. If they are on opposite sides of the ring, it is called trans, as shown in figure 2.8. These same terms can be used for molecules with double bonds, as explained later in this chapter. Cis, same, trans, opposite. Should we draw an example of that? Let's do pictures instead of description. 
A picture is worth a thousand words, right? Here. Both are coming out. And this trans example, one's coming out. And one is going in. So I don't know if they said this, but the uh, the coming out of the page is the darkened wedge, and the going into the page is the dotted wedge. Configurational isomers. Unlike conformational isomers that interconvert by simple bond rotation, configurational isomers can only change from one another to from, from one form to another by breaking and removing covalent bonds. The two category the two categories of configurational isomers are and antiomers and diastereomers. And antiomers and antiomers and diastereomers. Diastereomer. Both enantiomers and diastereomers, diastereomers can also be considered optical isomers because the different spatial arrangement of groups in these molecules affects the rotation of plane polarized light. And an Tiomers and diastereomers. Also optical isomers. Chirality. An object is considered chiral if its mirror image cannot be superimposed on the original object. This implies that the molecule lacks any internal plane of symmetry. Chirality can also be thought of as handedness. In fact, one of the easiest visualizations of chirality is to think of your own hands is shown in figure 2.9. Although essentially identical, your left hand will not be able to fit into a right-handed glove. Achiral objects have mirror images that can be superimposed. For example, a fork is identical to its mirror image and is therefore achiral. On the MCAT, we will often see this concept tested and when there is a carbon atom with four different substituents. This carbon will be an asymmetrical core of optical activity and is known as a chiral center. As mentioned earlier, chiral centers lack a plane of symmetry. For example, the C1 carbon atom in a 1-bromo-1-chloroethane has four different substituents, as shown in figure 210. This molecule is chiral because it is not superimposable on its mirror image. All right. Two molecules that are non-superimposable mirror images of each other are called enantiomers. Molecules may also be re related as diastereomers. These molecules are chiral and share the same connectivity but are not mirror images of each other. 
This is because they differ at some but not all of their multiple chiral centers. and antiomers and diastereomers. So, both enantiomers and diastereomers are chiral, though, right? Yeah, they're saying these molecules, including diastereomers and enantiomers. get into diastereomers we do all right so we'll get deeper into it I guess so near your image not near image All right. Alternatively, a carbon atom with only three different substituents, such as 1,1-dibromoethane, has a plane of symmetry and is therefore achiral. Simple 180-degree rotation around a vertical axis is shown in 2.11 allows the compound to be superimposed upon its mirror image. All right. It's an achiral molecule. Enantiomers, non-superimposable mirror images, have the same connectivity but opposite configurations at every chiral center in the molecule. Enantiomers have identical physical and chemical properties with two notable exceptions, opt optical activity and reactions in chiral environments. A compound is optically active if it has the ability to rotate plane polarized light. Ordinary light is unpolarized which means that it consists of waves vibrating in all possible plane, planes perpendicular to its direction of propagation. A polarizer allows light waves oscillating only in a particular direction to pass through, producing plane polarized light as shown in figure 2.12. Optical activity refers to the rotation of this plane polarized light by a chiral molecule. At the molecular level, one enantiomer will rotate plane polarized light to the same magnitude but in the opposite direction of its mirror image, assuming concentration and path lengths are equal. A compound that rotates the plane of polarized light to the right 
or clockwise is dextro rotatory rotatory dextro rotatory d and is labeled plus a compound that ro rotates light towards the left or counterclockwise is levoratory levorato levorotatory levorotatory l and is labeled minus Direction, direction of rotation cannot be determined from the structure of a molecule and must be determined experimentally. That is, it is not related to the absolute configuration of the molecule. All right, optical activity. Clockwise is D Dex Tro Rotatory gets a plus counterclockwise is Levo Ro. Tatori, and it gets a minus. The amount of rotation depends on the number of molecules that a light wave encounters. This depends on two factors, the concentration of the optical, opt, optically active compound and the length of the tube through which the light passes. Chemists have set standard conditions of one gram per milliliter for concentration and one dm or 10 centimeters for length to compare the optical activities of different compounds. Rotations measured at different concentrations in tube lengths can be converted to a standardized specific rotation using the following equation. Alpha equals the observed alpha over C times L, where alpha is a specific rotation in degrees uh, uh, the observed alpha is the observed rotation in degrees, and C is the concentration in grams per milliliter, and L is the path length in dm. When both positive and negative enantiomers are present in equal concentrations, they form a racemic mixture. In these solutions, the rotations cancel each other out, and no optical activity is observed. If an antiomerism is analogous to handedness, racemic mixtures are the equivalent of ambidexterity. These solutions possess no over handedness overall and will not rotate plane polarized light. Let's write this equation down here that the observed rotation over C times L All we have here is concentration, length, observed, rotation, and specific rotation. And I should have some brackets around the first alpha. All right. The fact that enantiomers have identical physical and chemical properties prompts a question about racemic mixtures. How can one separate the mixture into two constituent isomers? The answer lies in the relationship between enantiomers and diastereomers. Reacting two enantiomers with a single enantiomer of another compound will, by definition, lead to two diastereomers. Imagine, for example, two enantiomers that contain only one chiral carbon. 
these compounds could be labeled plus and minus. If each is reacted with only the plus enantiomer of another compound, two products would result, plus plus and minus plus. Because these two products differ at some but not all chiral centers, they are necessarily diastereomers. Diastereomers have different physical properties, as we will explore momentarily. These differences enable one to separate these products by common laboratory techniques such as crystallization, filtration, distillation, and others. Once separated, these diastereomers can be reacted to generate the original enantiomers. Diastereomers. Diastereomers are non-mirror image configurational isomers. Diastereomers occur when a molecule has two or more stereogenic centers and differs at some but not all of these centers. This means that diastereomers are required to have multiple chiral centers. For any molecule with n chiral centers, there are two to the n possible stereoisomers. Thus, if a compound has two chiral carbon atoms, it has a maximum of four possible stereoisomers, as shown in figure 213. All right. In this image, one can see that one and two are mirror images of each other and are therefore enantiomers of each other. Similarly, three and four are enantiomers. However, one and three are not. These are stereoisomers that are not mirror images and are thus diastereomers. Notice that other combinations of non-mirror image stereoisomers are also diastereomers. One and four, two and three, and two and four. Diastereomers have different chemical properties, however. Uh, they might behave similarly in particular reactions because they have the same functional groups. Because they have different arrangements in space, they will cons consistently have different physical properties. Uh, diastereomers will also rotate plane polarized light. However, knowing the specific rotation of one diastereomer gives no indication of the specific rotation of another diastereomer. This is a stark contrast from enantiomers, which will always have equal magnitude rotations in opposite directions. Cis-trans isomers. Cis-trans isomers, formerly called ge geometric isomers, cis-trans geometric isomers, are a specific subtype of diastereomers in which substituents differ in their position around an immovable bond such as a double bond or around a ring structure such as cycloalkane in which the rotation of bonds is greatly restricted. In simple compounds with only one substituent on either side of the immovable bond, we use the terms cis and trans. If two substituents are on the same side of the immovable bond, the molecule is considered cis. If they are on opposite sides, it is considered trans, as shown in figure 2.8 earlier. For more complicated compounds with polysubstituted double bonds, EZ nomenclature is used instead, as described in the next section.
cis trans EZ. Meso compounds. For a molecule to have optical activity, it must not only have chiral centers, uh, but also a lack, it must lack a plane of symmetry. Thus, if a plane of symmetry exists, the molecule is not optically active, even if it possesses chiral centers. This plane of symmetry can occur either through the chiral center or between chiral centers. A molecule with chiral centers that has an internal plane of symmetry is called a mesocompound, example of which is shown in figure 214. All right. Meso compounds have chiral centers have chiral centers, but also planes of symmetry. As shown in this image, D and L tartaric acid are both op optically active, but mesotartaric acid has a plane of symmetry and is not optically active. This means that even though mesotartaric acid has two chiral carbon atoms, the molecule as a whole does not display optical activity. Meso compounds are essentially the molecular equivalent of a racemic mixture. All right. What is the difference between a conformational and a configurational isomer? Conformational isomers differ only uh, around a single bond. And they can rotate to become each other. Uh, configurational, they would have to go through, uh, they would have to gain and lose bonds to become the other. And they uh, are non-superimposable. When you take the mirror image, it will not superimpose because uh, at least one chiral center is arranged differently, arranged in a different uh, configuration. Two, briefly summarize the differences between enantiomers and diastereomers. Enantiomers are the ones that are superimposable, or they're not superimposable, but they are mirror images. Uh, diastereomers are no longer mirror images. Uh, same physical properties. Uh, enantiomers do, diastereomers don't. Chemical properties, enantiomers do, and diastereomers don't. With exception to optical activity, obviously, Op they both have optical activity. What is a mesocompound? That is a diastereomer that does not have optical activity because it has a plane of symmetry that will cancel out any uh, polarization of light. If we check the answers, let's check the answers to these.
Conformational isomers are stereoisomers with the same molecular connectivity at different points of rotation around a single bond. Configurational isomers are stereoisomers with different molecular connectivity. Enantiomers are non-superimposable mirror images, while diastereomers are non-mirror image optical isomers. Uh, enantiomers have the same physical pop properties except for uh, plain polar polarized light. Uh, diastereomers have different physical properties. And in antiomers have the same chemical properties except uh, reactions in chiral environments. That's right. And diastereomers have different chemical properties. And a meso compound contains chiral centers but also has an internal plane of symmetry. This means that the molecule is overall achiral and will not rotate plane polarized light. And looking back at the uh, first set of questions, uh, I said that cyclopropanol and pro... Yeah, I left out uh, that they're all isomers, structural isomers. All right. So yeah, going back to the first set of questions. It says that cyclopropanol, acetone, and prop 2 en one all are all structural isomers. They have the same chemical formulas, at least. Yeah, I forgot that acetone has the same chemical formula as propanol, huh? Except acetone has the OH in the middle. Propanols have them on the end, I guess. Not two propanol. Two propanol is the same as acetone, isn't it? Oh no, acetone is butanol, two butanol maybe. Let's look up acetone real quick. Oh, it's more like butanol, I guess. All right. All right, relative and absolute configurations. The configuration of a stereoisomer refers to the spatial arrangement of the atom or group in the molecule. Uh, the relative configuration of a chiral molecule is its configuration in relation to another chiral molecule, often through chemical inner conversion. We can use the relative configuration to determine whether molecules are enantiomers, diastereomers, or the same molecule. On the other hand, the absolute conformation of a chiral molecule describes the exact spatial arrangement of these atoms or groups independent of other molecules. All right. E and Z forms. E and Z nomenclature is used for compounds with polysubstituted double bonds. Recall that simpler double bond containing compounds can use the cis-trans system. To determine the EZ designation, one starts by identifying the highest priority substituent attached to each double bonded carbon. Using the Kahn-Ingold prelog, 
priority rules. Priority is assigned based on the atom bonded to the double bonded carbons. The higher the atomic number, the higher the priority. If the atomic numbers are equal, priority is determined by the next atoms outward. Again, whichever group contains the atom with the highest atomic number is given top priority. If a tie remains, the atoms in this group are compared one by one in descending atomic number order until the tie is broken. The alkene is named Z, uh, German uh, Zusamen, together. If the two highest priority substituents on each carbon are on the same side of the double bond, and E, ent entjegen, opposite, if they are on opposite sides, as shown in figure 215. So across the double bond, the highest substituted being CH3, CH3 are on opposite sides. Wouldn't this be E? This is a double bond. Z for same, E for opposite. So Br gets more than CH3, or C, H, yeah, CH3 in this case. It says more hydrogens. This is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 hydrogens, while this has 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, same hydrogens. 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4, same carbons. So which is... More substituted, more substituted, same side, Z. More substituted, I guess this is more substituted, opposite sides. Z is like trans. They're on opposite sides. No, they're on the same side. Z for together. So this does not apply. It is cis is like Z and trans is like E. Z together. 
E opposite. All right, R and S forms. R and S nomenclature is used for chiral centers in molecules. We go through a set of through a set sequence to determine this absolute configuration. So let's look at R S. Step one: assign priority. Using the Kahn Ingold prelog priority rules. Uh, assign priority to the four substituents, looking only at the atoms directly attached to the chiral center. Once again, higher atomic number takes priority over lower atomic number. If the atomic numbers are equal, priority is determined by the combination of the atoms attached to these atoms. If there is a double bond, it is counted as two individual bonds to that atom. If a tie is encountered, work outward from the stereo center until the tie is broken. An example is shown in figure 2.16. Here we have chlorine gets one, two carbons gets two, one carbon gets three, and just a hydrogen gets a four. All right. Move this down a little bit because I just want to write this name using the con Ingold prelog priority rules. Step two, arrange in space. Orient the molecule in three-dimensional space so that the atom with the lowest priority, usually a hydrogen atom, is at the back of the molecule. Another way to think of this is to arrange the point of view so that the line of sight proceeds down the bond from the asymmetrical carbon atom, the chiral center, to the substituent with lowest priority. The three substituents with higher priority should then be radi radiate out from the ca central carbon. Coming out of the page is shown in figure 217. One, two, three. Step two, modified version. Invert the stereochemistry. If it is difficult to visualize rotating three-dimensional structures, one can simplify this process by remembering one simple rule. At any time, two groups are switched on a chiral carbon. The stereochemistry is inverted. By this logic, we can simply switch the lowest priority group with the group at the back of the molecule, substituent proje projecting into the page. We can then proceed to step three. Keep in mind that we have now changed the molecule to the opposite configuration. Therefore, if we use this, met if we use this modified step, we need to remember to switch our final, final answer, either R to S or S to R. This is a strategy we'll commonly use on Fisher diagrams as described below. Step three is draw a circle. Two was arrange in space. Three, draw a circle. Now imagine drawing a circle connecting the substituents from number one to two to three. Pay no attention to the lowest priority group. It can be skipped because it projects directly into the page. If the circle is drawn counterclockwise, the asymmetric carbon is called S, sinister, left. If it is clockwise, it is called R, rectus, right, as shown in figure 2.18. Remember to correct the stereochemistry if the modified version of step two was used. Let's 
So, counterclockwise is S, and clockwise is R. Step four. Once the RS designation has been determined, the name can be written out. R and S are put in parentheses and separated from the rest of the name by a hyphen. If we have a compound with more than one chiral center, location is specified by a number preceding the R or S within the parentheses and without a hyphen. All right. Step four, write the name. Fisher projections. On the MCAT, one way to represent three-dimensional molecules is by a Fisher projection. In this system, horizontal lines indicate bonds that project out from the plane of the page, wedges. Whereas vertical lines indicate bonds going into the plane of the page, dashes. The point of intersection of the lines represents a carbon atom. Horizontal lines are out of the page, whereas vertical lines indicate bonds going into the plane of the page. Wedges come out of the page, and dashes go into the page. Wedges come out of page, dashes go into page. All right. Another advantage is that we can manipulate Fisher projections without changing the compound. As mentioned before, switching two substituents around a chiral carbon will invert the stereochemistry. Uh, rotating a Fisher projection on the plane of the page by 90 degrees will also invert the stereochemistry of the molecule. By extension, interchanging any two pairs of substituents will revert the compound back to its original stereochemistry. And rotating a Fisher projection in the plane of the page by 180 degrees will also retain the stereochemistry of the molecule. These manipulations are shown in figure 219. All right. Again, determining the RS designation of a Fisher projection of a compound follows the same rules as described previously. But what if our lowest priority group is pointing to the side and as such pointing out of the page? Such as before, we've got a couple of different tricks to help determine the right stereochemistry. Option one, make no switches. Go ahead and determine the order of substituents as normal, drawing a circle from one to two to three. Remember, number four doesn't count. So just skip right over it when determining the order. Then obtain the RS designation. The true designation will be opposite of what you just obtained. Uh, option two, swap the lowest priority group with one group on the vertical axis. Obtain the RS designation. And once again, the true designation will be the opposite of what you just found. Or option three, make two switches in this method. Start with option two, moving the lowest priority group into the correct position. Then switch the other two groups as well because we made Two switches, this molecule will have the same designation as the initial molecule. This is the same as holding one substituent in place and rotating the other three in order. 
What is the difference between an E and a Z isomer? Uh, the chiral center. Oh no, this is a. Uh, in the difference between an E isomer and a Z isomer is around the double bonded carbons. Uh, the higher substituted groups being on the same side in the Z configuration and on opposite sides in the E configuration. What is priority assigned under Kahn, Ingold, Prelog priority rules? How is priority assigned? Uh, the highest atomic number gets the highest uh, priority, meaning the lowest number. Uh, if two molecules have, if the adjacent atoms have the same atomic weight, then you go over to the next atom after that, and then the next atom after that until you break the tie. If there are multiple uh, adjacent atoms, then you take the one with the highest atomic number first. All right. For each of the Fisher projection manipulations listed below, is stereochemistry retained or inverted? Switching a pair of constituents, inverted. Switching two pairs of constituents, retained. Rotating the molecule 90 degrees, inverted. Rotating 180 degrees, retained. Let's double check those. Invert, retain. Invert, retain. Right. All right. And some practice questions. Number one, which of the following does not show optical activity? Let's move this over a little. All right. Which of the following does not show optical activity? R2-butanol, S2-butanol, a solution containing one mole R2-butanol and two moles S2-butanol, a solution containing two moles R2-butanol and two moles S2-butanol. They have to be in equal concentrations for them to cancel out their optical activity. So I'm going to go with D. Number two, how many stereoisomers exist for the following aldehyde? How many stereoisomers exist? Well, you could switch the top around, switch the second one around. Well, I guess for each one of these, you could switch one, two, three, four, five. Five carbons that you could switch around. I guess it's two to the five then, right? But that's not even an option. So uh, 16, maybe just 16 then. Because you could flip that around, you flip this around. Flip rope with both around. So, yeah, even with respect to the first, if there's one, two, three, four that you could flip around, it's got to be at least two to the four, right? So, we'll go with 16. I'm going to go with D. 
which of the following compounds is optically active? This one is not. This could be, this could be, uh, these are, and antiomers. Because this happens to be the mirror image of that. Is optically inactive. Oh, they're looking for the one that's inactive. All of these are active. This is the one that's inactive. C. Because it has a plane of symmetry right down here, uh, it is a meso compound, right? Meso compound have chiral centers, but also planes of symmetry. So they are not optically active. 3C. Four, cholesterol shown below contains how many chiral centers? All right, so chiral centers are any of the centers that have different atoms. So this, since it has carbon and carbon on both, it's not chiral. So not a chiral center, not a chiral center, not, not. Not a chiral center. I guess it is a chiral center because this carbon. Now I'm going to go with not a chiral center. Not. And I guess I should count these as chiral centers. Because going this way, you hit other stuff before this way. So yes, this is a chiral center. One, two, three, four, five, six, Seven, eight, nine. I'm going to go with the max. I'm going to go with nine. Four, D, nine. Because there's a ton of them in there. Which isomer of the following compound is the most stable? I think these two look stable. This one looks unstable. Uh, but even this one, the methyl groups axially are less stable than equatorially. So B is the most stable of those. Six. The following reaction results in retented, re retention of relative configuration, configuration and a change in the absolute conf configuration, a change in relative and absolute configurations, retention of the relative and absolute configurations, retention of the absolute configuration, and change in the relative configuration. Let's see what happens here. Uh, We have this chiral center with an ethyl group, a methyl group, a hydrogen, and an OH group. And in this, you also have methyl, ethyl, hydrogen, but you have an oxygen. Instead of just OH, you have a an acid, a CO, a carboxylic acid. It's more than a carboxylic acid. That's a oxy, oxydioxide. No. 
oxycarboxylic acid. Either way, Let's say its absolute configuration has changed because it's one of its subs substitutions is just different. It's CO instead of just O. But maybe its relative configuration is still the same because uh, they're still in the same place. So I'll go with retention of relative. No, I'll go with retention of relative configuration and change in absolute configuration. A. Seven, the following molecules are considered to be, are they enantiomers, diastereomers, mesocompounds, compounds, or structural isomers? Well, they are mirror images, and if I take the mirror image and I try to superimpose it, doesn't quite work, does it? So I call them enantiomers, 7A. 8, plus glyceraldehyde and minus glyceraldehyde referred to the R and S forms of 2,3-dihydroxyoxypropanol. Dihydroxypropanol, respectively. These molecules are considered. Enantiomers, diastereomers, meso compounds, structural isomers. If there's a plus and a minus, if there's an R and S, it's a chiral center. Uh, if they only differ by one chiral center, then they're enantiomers. Let me look up glyceraldehyde, dihydroxypropanol. Propanal. Or propionaldehyde. Glyceraldehyde. Yeah, I call them enantiomers, right? Also A. Nine, consider 2-butene and the E and Z versions of 2-butene. This is a pair of what type of isomers? E and Z was cis-trans. Cis-trans is also a kind of diastereomer. So I guess one and two only. C. 10, three methyl pentane and hexane are related in that they are enantiomers, diastereomers, constitutional isomers, or conformational isomers. Methyl pentane and hexane, they have different names. So they could be constitutional isomers.
but not conformational isomers. Conformational isomer, constitutional isomers. Constitutional is the same as structural. Same as structural. So these are only structural. Yeah, they're not conformational isomers, they're constitutional isomers. 10 C. 11 R2 chloro S3 bromobutane and S2 chloro S3 bromobutane are. Enantiomers, no. Diastereomers, they could be. Meso compounds, probably not. The same molecule, probably not. Diastereomers, 11B. They can't be enantiomers because if you have an R and an S and you take the mirror image of that and then you get an S and an R, you can't get them to be the same. They, you can't get them to both be S by flipping it with a mirror. If they're opposites when you flip it in a mirror you'll still get 1s and 1r. So they can't be the enantiomeres. They can be diastereomeres. A scientist takes 0.5 uh, grams per milliliter solution of an unknown pure dextrorotatory organic molecule and places it in a test tube with a diameter of 1 centimeter. He observes that a plane of polarized light is rotated 12 degrees under these conditions. What is the specific rotation of this molecule? Well, going to this uh, equation here, the observed rotation divided by C concentration times L length. So Dividing by 0.5 is the same as multiplying by 2. So we take 12, multiply it by 2, should have a 24, a rotation of 24. Now is it positive or minus? It's a good question. It doesn't say to the left or right. But since there's no negative numbers, I'll just go with positive, 24. C. 13. Omeprazole is a proton pump inhibitor commonly used in gastroesophageal reflux disease. When omeprazole a racemic mixture went off patient, off patent. Pharmaceutical companies began to manufacture, manufacture esomeprazole, the S enantiomer of omeprazole, by itself. Given one mole solution of omeprazole and esomeprazole, which solution would likely exhibit? optical activity. So the original drug is a racemic mixture. Pharmaceutical companies began to manufacture the S and antiomer by itself, so the first one is racemic, would not show optical activity. The second one, that's just the S and antiomer, would show. 
optical activity. So, esomaprazole, esomaprazole only. 13B. 14. 2R3S, 2,3-dihydroxybutanidoic acid, and 2S3R, 2,3-dihydroxybutanidoic acid are uh, enantiomers, 3 only, B. If the methyl groups of butane are 120 degrees apart, as seen in a Newman projection, this molecule is in its uh, 120 apart is uh, not totally eclipsed, but it's eclipsed. So it's not in its highest energy. Uh, it's in its middle energy eclipsed form. So 15C, let's see how we did. 1D, 2 is going to be B, not D. The maximum number of stereoisomers of a compound equals 2 to the N, where N is the number of chiral carbons in the compound. In this molecule, C1, the aldehydic carbon, is not chiral, nor is C5 because it is attached to two hydrogens. Therefore, Three chiral centers, there are eight stereoisomers. So both the first one and the last one are not chiral. Two hydrogens, not chiral. So one, two, three. Two to the third power is eight. All right. Three is going to be C. Four is going to be C, not D. To be considered a chiral center, a carbon must have four different substituents. There are eight stereocenters in this molecule, which are marked below with asterisks. So not nine, but eight. First one is, second one is, this one is not because there's a double bond, so that can't be chiral. This one is, 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 this one is. So basically, this one I said was, but it can't be because it's a double bond. You can't have a chiral center on a double bonded carbon. All right. Five is B. Six is C, not A. The relative configuration is retained because the bond of the stereo centers are not broken. Thus, the position of groups around the chiral carbon are maintained. The absolute configuration is also retained because both the reactant and product are R. In 6, I assume this is different, but it's not. They're saying oxygen, oxygen, it's the same. Is that what they're saying? Or it's just the order. So this is still has a priority of 4, this still has a priority of 2, this still has a priority of 3, and this still has a priority of 1. Even though there's different molecules, it's 1, you know, the 1, 3, 4, 2. 1, 3, 4, 2. That's the same either way. The relative configuration is retained because the bonds of the stereocenters are not broken. So in the stereocenter, those bonds are not broken. Just what oxygen is bonded to on the outside here is changed. The absolute configuration is also retained because both the reactant and product are R. So absolute configuration, whether it's R and S, it's still R because it's 1, 2, 1, 
two, uh, one, two, three. So that was S, and then you flip it because we had to skip one, so we flip it to R. And it's the same in both cases. So absolute is just what it is, R or S. Relative is the positions of groups around the chiral carbon, meaning one, three, four, two. All right. That would be number six. Number seven is A, eight is A, nine is C, 10 is C, 11 is B, 12 is D, not C. Remember that the equation for specific rotation in this example, uh, the observed alpha is 12, uh, or clockwise rotation. Uh, C is 0.5, one uh, centimeter is the length. Oh, that's 0.1 decimeters. You have to change it to 0.1. Remember that path length is always measured in decimeters when calculating specific rotation. Therefore, the specific rotation can be calculated to be 240, not 24. I got to multiply by 10 because we don't use centimeters. We use decimeters. Instead of 24, it goes up to 240D. All right. 13 is B, 14 is C, not B. Uh, draw out the structures. Two names describe the same molecule, which also happens to be a meso compound because it contains a plane of symmetry. These compounds are not in antiomers because they are superimposable mirror images of one another, not, not non-superimposable mirror images. These compounds are better termed meso 23 dihydroxybutyl butanidoic acid. So, even though SNR is changed around, since it's dihydroxy, it's oxy on both of them. This one's uh, let's see one, two, three, four, R. This one's R, this one's S. But since there's a plane of symmetry, it becomes a meso compound. And indeed, they are the same molecule. So just because they have R and S, you can't, it's not enough to tell you whether they're in antiomers or not, because the right combination of an R and S might be the exact same molecule. If you switch both of them, in this, like in this case, it's the exact same molecule. So you really have to draw it out and ascertain the chirals, each chiral center. In this case, it's a meso compound, and it does happen to be the same molecule. One and two is C. And finally, 15 is C. That is it for isomers. Next time, we'll get into bonding.